And the Bible reading today is from John 15, verses 1 to 17, and it's Jesus speaking to his disciples. I am the true vine, and my father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit, while every branch that does bear fruit he prunes, so that it will bear even more fruit. You are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. Remain in me as I also remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. But apart from me, you can do nothing. If you do not remain in me, you are like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up and thrown into the fire and burned. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. This is to my Father's glory, that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Now remain in my love. If you keep my commands, you will remain in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commands and remain in his love. I have told you this, that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. My command is this, love each other as I have loved you. Greater love has no man than this, to lay down one's life for one's friends. You are my friends if you do what I command. I no longer call you servants because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I have called you friends. For everything that I have learned from my Father, I have made known to you. You do not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you so that you might go and bear fruit, fruit that will last. And so that whatever you ask in my name, the Father will give you. This is my command. Love one another. Amen. Hello again, everyone. We've been sitting for a little bit. Why don't you, I know there's a bit of distance between you all, but why don't you just quickly say hello to some people around you. And if you are tuning in over the live stream and haven't had a chance to check in, let us know you're here. Please say hi, let us know you, you've come today. And in just a moment, I'll get us started. All right. Well, I trust you're all well, even amidst this wild weather. And I hope you've brought your Bibles as well. I'm going to continue to encourage you to bring a physical Bible. I'm going to do this probably until the day that I leave or the Lord comes. And so please bring a physical Bible if you can. I think it is such a valuable thing to have that sitting in front of you. To plumb the depths of that, you'll gain so much more out of bringing your own and being able to work through that. Also, it means that I know you've got it and you're using it at home as well. We've been journeying through a series through John 13 to 17, and tonight we come to chapter 15, and fruit is on the cards. Well, it's on the tree, in a way. I don't know if any of you... Have any of you ever been cherry-picking or fruit-picking? Even just gone to get some strawberries or blueberries or something, yeah? I Partway through my university degree... I thought it would be a great idea to go cherry picking for a few weeks. Down in Young, I uh, went away with a few mates and my, my girlfriend Vic at the time is now my wife, and we went picking the trees in, um, in Young. And so you camp, you get up super early in the morning, you go out and you get given this lug. Now the lug sits in front of you like this, and the idea is that as you pull the branch down and you pick these cherries, it drops into your lug. And as you, 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 you fill that lug up, that is 
technically the, the thing that you're getting paid for. If you fill a lug, you get a particular price for your lug. So you want to fill that lug and you want to fill it as quickly as you possibly can. And so that means if you come up to a tree and you view the tree, you think this is a good tree or not based on how big and juicy and plump those beautiful cherries are. And then you try not to eat too many for a couple of reasons, but we won't get into that. So you, you, you're picking, you're picking, you're picking, and you really hope that you come to a tree that even if it looks beautiful and green and lush, within those branches is delicious, big, juicy fruit. Yes, amen. And so we found that we were actually, whenever you go to a particular tree, you could look at the tree from a distance and sort of gauge whether that tree was going to have good fruit or not. And you started to discover there were some trees that had next to no fruit on them. And so you'd do your best to try and avoid those. And you'd come to other trees and you'd, you'd see some fruit on there and you'd think, oh no, this is a pea tree. Now it was called a pea tree because the cherries were about the size of a pea, which means if you're picking peas to fill that lug, it takes a little bit longer than those big juicy cherries that we all love to eat at Christmas time, right? And then there was those trees. And those trees were a joy to be within because it was nice and lush and you picked and you picked and you picked and down they fell. Very quickly, we could even discover when we went to the farm, whether it was going to be a tree, whether it was going to be a farm that had good trees on it, because you could see whether that farmer, whether that gardener had taken care of his or her trees. You could tell whether there was going to be good, ripe, plump, juicy fruit produced on those things. Just like when you drive through Mudgee, and I'll talk about this a bit more later, you can see all the beautiful vines and maybe even from the road, the glistening plump fruit of the grapes on those vines. I love grapes. We got grapes this week in the shop and I opened the fridge and it was joy inside my heart as I plucked one of those juicy big grapes and it just burst in my mouth. Fruit's delicious, isn't it? And when you see a tree that is in full fruit, it is a glorious thing. You just want to go up there and pick that stuff off, don't you? What produces fruit? Well, a quality vine or a quality tree that's been well tended and taken care of will produce the best fruit, won't it? And today, John 15 is all about producing fruit. Today, it's all, well, fruit and the joy that comes with that, because today we're looking at this idea of Jesus having His joy that is also our joy. We will share in this joy and it will complete us. Do you see that in verse 11? Have a look again, verse 11, I have told you this, so all that He's going to tell us today that we're going to look at, so that my joy may be in you, so His joy in us, and that your joy may be complete. And what's he going to tell them? He's going to tell them to bear fruit. Because he's going to tell them something actually very unexpected for these people. These people are Israelites. They've grown up as Jews. They've had a particular understanding. And so it's something unexpected, but it's right. In verse 1, when he says boldly, I am the true vine. I am the true vine. And he repeats that in verse 5, doesn't he? I am the vine. And then he tells us what we are. You are the branches. I'm the vine, you are the branches. And today we get to delve into this beautiful thing of the intimacy that we get to have with Christ Jesus. This is an incredible passage, a life-giving passage, a, a spiritually reviving passage, I hope, for those, for those of us who know and love Jesus and for those of us who may have never actually experienced that relationship with Him, having Him dwell within us, this is deeply intimate so I hope it's inspiring and transforming, but it's also going to cut. Today's passage is cutting because it's interrogating. It's going to ask some deep questions of your inner life. And so please prepare your hearts, be ready. And that's why right now I'm going to pray that it's God's words that do that. Because if God's words do that, He will then produce in you joy. And if it's just my words, then you're just probably just going to get offended. And I don't want that. So why don't we pray, why don't we ask God to come and really speak to us about the fruit that He wants to produce in our lives and the joy that He has prepared for us. Let me pray. Father God, what a wonderful thing it is that we have the opportunity to know You. And not just to, to know You in theory, but to live with You, to have You dwelling within us, to have the, the Spirit here with us now, to have You coursing through our bodies and our veins, producing the fruit of the inner spiritual life that you do. I pray, Lord, that today as we take a look at these words, you might open up our hearts and prepare us so that you speak clearly to us, so that what, what is received from us comes from you and therefore produces in us that wonderful fruit, that fruit of the Spirit, and that great joy that comes with knowing 
and loving and serving and experiencing intimacy with you, Jesus. And so we pray this in your name, to the Father's glory. Amen. What did he say in verse 5? Have a look again. I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. Now, often when I preach, I'll try to just step straight through a passage, but today it'll be, we'll jump a little bit just so we're, which is why it's helpful to have it in front of you. But I'm hoping at the end of today, we see how wonderful it is to intimately be attached to Christ. And so we'll see how it is that in, in three parts, we see that Jesus explains how we abide in Christ and so persist in that. But by abiding in Christ, we then need to be prepared to be pruned. That might be a bit cutting and difficult so that we then produce Christ-like fruit. So we'll abide, we'll prepare to be pruned, and we'll produce Christ-like fruit. And so to begin with, let's have a look at this abiding that we get to have. Uh, If any of you have been um, getting the emails weekly, you'll see that I actually like gardening. I quite enjoy gardening, and I really love a good pot plant too, so I've brought in a little example of one today. This is my prop, this is my, it's not, it doesn't produce grapes, but have you ever seen one of these? This is called, come over here, it's called a devil's ivy. I know it might sound a bit awkward saying that in church, but look at the length of this. I'm very proud of this because it started as just, and I've got one in my office at the, uh, my study up at church at the moment, which only has one about this long, like to about there. This has taken years to get to this. How? By watering it and caring for it and plucking off the dead leaves and making sure that it gets the right amount of sun and water and is positioned perfectly. I love my little devil's ivy. That's a bit like the gardener in this. What did it say, verse 1? I am the true vine, and my Father is the gardener. It's very simple, isn't it? Very simple. But this is an unexpected, an unexpected thing. Now, there's unexpected and wrong. Like, for example, if you went up to an orange tree and were disappointed that there was no apples on it, you're just wrong. Yes? But there's unexpected and right, because we have to get this right. We have to understand what's really going on in this situation. I had another tree that I was trying to guard. When I moved into the place when we first started at Nawi Baptist Church, there was this tree out the back, and I got super excited because I'm like, it's a lime tree. It looked like a lime tree. It had beautiful leaves ready to, but it needed some pruning. So I cut it right back. This thing grew, and after the first year, I was waiting for the fruit. No fruit came. Disappointed. Lime tree, what are you doing to me? Next year, It started to produce, and it produced this one little fruit, but then it just dropped off and died. It didn't really work. The year after, though, there was a few fruit popping up to this thing, but I was so disappointed because they weren't limes. It was a kumquat tree. (laughs) I was like, this doesn't taste like a lime. It doesn't look like a lime, but it was actually what was right. It was true. That tree that I'd been tending was actually revealed to me a kumquat tree. Right here, Jesus reveals the true reality of who the true vine is through what he says in these verses. But it's unexpected. Because let me explain. When you're an Israelite, you hear vine or vineyard, you know what you think? You think, oh, me and the people of Israel. Israel was described as the vine. The vineyard was then looked after by the farmer, by God. Like, let me just take you to Isaiah Five, very quickly. If you've got your Bible, you can flick there. It won't be up on the screen for this one. You can just listen in. Nearly always, whenever the vine is presented, it's a, it's a, simple, it's a symptom of talking about how it is that they've failed. But listen to this. Verse, verse 1 of chapter 5. Here is, here is the Lord. He says, I will sing for the, for the one I love, a song about his vineyard. My loved one had a vineyard on a fertile hillside. He dug it up and cleared off all the stones and planted it with the choicest vines. So he's prepared it and he's planted his vine. He built a watchtower in it and cut out a wine press as well. Then he looked for a good crop of good grapes, but it yielded only bad fruit. And if you jump down to verse 7, the vineyard of the Lord Almighty is the nation of Israel and the people of Judah are the vines he delighted in. See that? This is Israel. And he looked for justice but saw bloodshed for righteousness, but heard cries of distress. Do you see how this then is a very, very different picture? They're expecting, the vineyard, the vine, was the people of God. And here Jesus is saying, I am the true vine. You are the branches attached to that. And it's simple, right? Like, let's go back to my prop. This is, this is the vine, and these are, well, that's the leaves that have not been attached to it anymore. Or like in my backyard, I brought a few props today. 
we've got this big, massive mop top. And you, I don't know if you know about mop tops, but mop tops send out runners and they can pop up elsewhere in the garden. And so here's one I prepared earlier this week. That is one of the branches from the other one that I chopped off early this week, withered, dying. And this is one I chopped off this morning. You can see the life that was in it because it was attached to the vine, to the trunk, to the tree. And here, here is a branch from a gum tree out the back that I was going to use to start a fire before the flood came. <laughs> dry, withered, dead. You can see what the point is that he's trying to make, can't you? Dependence on life. Have a look, verses 4 four and 6 of our passage, back in John 15, verse 4, it says, remain in me as I also remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself, it must remain in the vine. You detach it, nothing. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. And then verse 6, if you do not remain in me, connected, attached in him, you are like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire and burned. Like the branch I was using to prepare a barbecue. Scan your eyes through. Look how often the word remain or abide it might be in your Bible, depending on your translation, is there. It is everywhere. This is the main point of this passage. Remain. Don't leave this realm. Stay attached, connected. So the disciples, in their situation at this present moment, they're going, oh no, the Lord Jesus is about to leave. And what does he tell them? What does he say about their relationship? No, no, no. I'm going away, but you will still be intimately connected to me. Remember, I sent the Spirit and you need to remain that way. And so us too, disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ, what is ours? Well, it should be intimately connected, abiding. Do you have this relationship? with the Lord Jesus Christ. He defines your relationship here, doesn't he? It's sort of that moment in that relationship where it's like, what are we? Well, here it is. I am the vine, you are the branches. I am the life source, the very life source, and you are completely dependent on me. But what a beautiful image this is. Because you don't, you wouldn't see me in my backyard out there going, well, what are you doing, Brett? I'm, I'm watering the plants, watering this stick. You wouldn't see me even watering the branches. I've got to get to the very base, to the vine, and see that's where the life source comes from, don't I? And then those branches are fused, intimately connected to the vine. This is a beautiful picture of the inner life. The very life that a Christian gets is from the sap that flows through that tree into our branches, into our lives. This is his indwelling. And so let me ask, what is our role with all of this then? May roll it back, firstly, though. Because... Do you have this personal intimacy with the Lord Jesus Christ? And then we can ask, how do you grow? How do you deepen this intimacy? Do you have it? Because for many of us, we look at the Christian faith and we think about how we know and keep it. So no, we could sum up in the idea of doctrine. And we've we've seen that already in this series, John 14. Believe, believe, know that I am the way, the truth and the life. Believe that I am God's one that has been sent And then keep it. And he says it, keep my commands. And that's how you know I love it. So ethically, we keep these things. We've got doctrines, we've got ethics. But what about the life of it? Experiencing it. The inner realities of knowing the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ living in each and every single one of us. Remaining in Him and He in me. See, all three of those things are essential. And that last one can very easily slip away. Because it's from this, from all three of these things, that it actually flows to beautiful bunches of grapes that we get to have inside, that then present on the outside. The inner life of the Christian, the fruit-bearing reality of a Christian life. Do you have this? Let me tell you, the answer is yes, if you believe. If you do seek to keep, it is there. But then how do you foster that, to have that deep and wonderful intimacy with our Lord Jesus Christ? Well, verse 3 tells us you have it, doesn't it? You are already clean because of the word I've spoken to you. It's done. If you believe in the word, if you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, you have this. But how do we foster? How do we abide? Verse 4, remain in me, he says, as I also remain in you. For no branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. How do we do that? Well, it's a bit like a marriage, isn't it? So Vic and I were married on the 7th of February, 2009 was when Mike was... No, 2009, 2009, I was right. 7th of February, 2009, so 12 years, 12 years now we've been married. And on that day, we got up and we made commitments to each other and we said, yes, I know that you are committing your life to me and I'm committing my life to you in this union of marriage. So we know it, we can point to the date, it's happened. 
And then we seek to keep those promises. We keep those promises. But imagine then that's all we did. That we never actually sort of communicated, interacted, had time together, shared, laughed, lived, enjoyed, suffered, cried, went through all of that stuff, didn't actually dwell in that. Didn't actually experience that, abide together. It'd be a pretty ordinary marriage, wouldn't it? Now, why do I use the marriage relationship? Well, it's, it's this sort of picture that the Bible picks up about our union with Christ and our union with the Lord. The biblical language that Paul uses even of the head connected to the body, it's organic. You've got the vine here and then Old Testament and New Testament language is constantly marriage relationship. And so let me ask you, do you have that? Do you just know and keep and you don't really live? You're kind of like two ships passing in the night uh, that relationships can be like. Or do you really have that intimate connection? How do you foster that? Well, it's fairly simple, but it's hard, isn't it? Let me encourage you with some practical steps here. To abide, we need to draw near, we need to draw from, and then we need to depend on. So firstly, draw near and do that often. If I only saw Vic once every so often, I wouldn't be near her, I wouldn't be with her, would I? How often do you genuinely draw near to our Lord and Saviour? Do you have rhythms in your life that help you, aside from just church? Do you have rhythms in your life that help you to draw near regularly? Because for some of us, it might be that the only rhythm we have is Sunday. And then others, it might be Sunday and... start of the day. We're going to, I think, spend some time on this over the next little bit. I think rhythms are one of those things that for many people have been neglected. There's generations I know that have been very, very good. The Bible before breakfast people, man, the navigators, that's wonderful. But for some of us, we've lost some of that. And then what about drawing from? Do we deeply know the words of life? Do we understand that we have the spirit of truth living and dwelling within us? He is there, He is present that we can draw strength from. I mean, even just think from this passage, what can I draw from this passage? It says, you are the vine, which means I am your branch, Lord. You have cleaned me, which means I am clean. I am drawing from the life source that he's giving. You are life, it says, I have life. I ask and you can give. Are we drawing from this source and not all sorts of other sources for our dependence? Because the final one is depend on, to trust. Pure dependence upon this vine. And you see that in verse 7, the expression that I'll come back to later is it's in prayer, asking and crying out, I need you for all of this because He is the vine, verse 5, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, He says, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, what can you do? Nothing. Is that true though? Because I feel like I can do a lot of things without reference to Christ or without thinking about Him dwelling within me. I mean, I think about a lot of things I can do. I can do soccer, I can dance, I can sing, I can gym, I can raise my family, I could probably maintain a house and be hospitable, I can care for my friends even, I can give to the church, that 10% and maybe even more, I can, I can do all those things. I can serve in ministries, bring people to the Lord even and help them understand that Jesus is the Lord, their Lord and Saviour. You could even lead a church which is why these words need to cut me too, because you can do all of this apart from Christ. We will need to see what these bunches of grapes are then in a moment, won't we? What the real fruit is. But apart from me, he says, you can do nothing of spiritual benefit. Nothing that's not simply plastic. Plastic fruit. And who wants to chew on a piece of that? See, we can sticky tape fruit all over us. But what's going to happen to that fruit? It's not going to last. It's going to rot. Or it's just plastic. No use as fruit at all. And so how do we do this? Well, we abide. We have to draw near. We have to draw from. We have to depend on. Because the reality is that He does the main work anyway. Have a look. Because what does He do? Verses 1 to 2. I am the true vine and my Father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit, while every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes, so that it'll be even more fruitful. Both words for cuts there, they're two different words, but they both basically mean cut. 
Do you see that? The good gets the knife. The good branch gets cut. The producers are pruned. I'm not sure I like that. I'm not sure I really want to preach that to a bunch of people who I see, I do see fruit in many of you, I'm going to get to that, don't you worry, I'm not sure whether I like that, but picture it this way, the gardener, a master who knows how to prune, he loves his vine, and so he carefully, he personally, he closely is pruning and caring and taking care of it. Remember I mentioned um, Mudgy? I grew up in Lithgow, and used to play soccer all throughout sort of the central west, and so we used to have to drive out to Dubbo sometimes, or to Mudgy, or, and you'd drive through, and winter sports, soccer, so when you drive through there, what do you see when you're driving along these gnarly, gnarly little clumps of, just, it looked like sticks with lots of wires along them? It was the vines, but they're in their, they're in their off season, and so they've been pruned right back. But you go back there in the summer, and what do you see? You see fields of green, long streaming lines of beautiful vines filled with grapes. It's a beautiful picture. Norm shared with me, I caught up with Norm this week, and he shared with me about his wife's Shirley's poor roses, actually. So he'd taken the roses and he had them in pot plants, and somebody came past and saw them and said, hey, could I, could I maybe prune those roses for you? Because he'd seen that they'd gone all a little bit wild. And so she came and she pruned them, and she did such a poor job that it started to kill off those roses. Pruning's an important thing, isn't it? Careful, good, correct pruning will either mean something flourishes, or something is outdone. Grape growers, any growers, any, any viticulturists in here? Doubt it. I'd love, I'd love to have a, vi- a vineyard. I, it's, I, don't, I think it's beyond me, but I, I, I think it's just one of the coolest things, because during growing season, what do they do? They sort of pick and pinch, and are very careful about which parts that they, they take and don't take, so that it will produce fruit. And then in the off-season, in winter, what do they do? They cut it right back to the stub almost. And I've been told, this could be controversial to say, but the best wines come from the oldest vines, the ones that over the years have been pruned, taken care of, they will produce the best fruit. It doesn't look good though, does it? It seems wasteful when you hack that tree back, but this is what produces. It doesn't feel good. I could imagine if I, if I was one of those vines, that would be painful, but this is what produces fruit. So what is pruning? What is pruning but the Father's love for us? In Hebrews 12, this is what it says. Hebrews 12, verse 10. They disciplined us, I'm talking about earthly fathers, for a little while, as they thought best. But God disciplines us for our good, in order that we may share in His holiness. What is pruning? But God's careful cutting and shaping of you, in order that you will produce fruit. I don't know how many of you know C.S. Lewis. C.S. Lewis has that wonderful Narnia series, and there's one book in, in it called The Voyage of the Dawn Treader. Has anybody read that out there? A few people, yes. I haven't actually read it, but I know of this story about the undragoning of Eustace. So Eustace is a character that, well, from all accounts that I've been told, if you met him, you'd want to punch him, because he's not the nicest fellow at the beginning. Is that right? Yeah, he's a, he's a bit, bit rough. He's, he's arrogant, he's self-centered, he's, he's annoying to, he, to Edmund and to Lucy, he's just a pain in the neck, you want to, yeah, get rid of this guy. And Eustace is also a little bit greedy, and so in the story he finds a dragon's lair, and because he's so greedy for the treasure, he goes into the lair and he puts on one of the, the gold bracelets, and then when he awakes, sleeping on a dragon's hoard with greedy dragonish thoughts in his heart is written, he finds out that he's become a dragon himself, and he awakes... But then that night, Aslan comes to him. Aslan the lion, who is to, if you've read the C.S. Lewis books, he's the, the image of the picture of God. And he says, the water that is here, if you, if you can go into it, you will be cleansed and clean, but you must rip off your dragony scales before you're able to get into that. And so Eustace found that no matter how many layers of the dragony scales and the skin that he tried to peel off himself, he was still a dragon. Then the lion said, and I don't know, it says, if it spoke, you'll have to let me undress you. But I was afraid of his claws, I can tell you, but I was pretty nearly desperate now. So I just lay flat down on my back to let him do it. The very first tear he made was so deep that I thought it had gone right into my heart. And when he began pulling the skin off, it hurt worse than anything I've ever felt. 
The only thing that made me able to bear it was just the pleasure of feeling the stuff peel off. Well, he peeled the beastly stuff right off. And there was I, as smooth and as soft as a peeled switch and smaller than I had been. Then he caught hold of me. I didn't like that much. I was very tender underneath now that I had no skin. And threw me into the water. It smarted like anything, but only for a moment. After that, I became perfectly delicious. And as soon as I started swimming and splashing, I found that all the pain had gone from my arm. And then I saw why. I turned into a boy again. He'd been ripped of all the stuff. He'd been pruned, hadn't he? Pruning in good times. I know there's people in this church, and I've only been here a short time, who have experienced pain and difficulties in their lives, who have had stuff that they've had to desperately cling to their gracious God through and found that really, really tough. And this could be hard. But there are cuts and there are consequences. So there's cuts that the Lord disciplining us, and there are just consequences of the reality of this evil suffering that we have in this world, yeah? There is a difference, and we may never know which is which. We can't know. But both cuts and consequences, they push us to the same place, don't they? When we know Jesus is the true vine, the way, the truth, and the life, when we know and experience His love, then there's only one place that we can turn in both those times, dependence and trust on Him. See, we don't naturally want this. I I don't naturally want to be disciplined. But look at what it produces. All of this may be sounding really, really negative, but this is only negative for those of us who have not seen a vineyard in full bloom, right? See some of the branches, and I've got to meet some of the branches who have been pruned but are in full bloom. The gardener loves his vine, carefully, personally, closely, See, when he sometimes feels like he's at his most distant, that's when he's actually closest. Now, I've focused in on the pruning, and many of you who are astute readers and you have your Bibles open in front of you would have gone, hey, you've missed that part where it says they are cut off and those ones that aren't attached and are thrown into the fire, right? I'm not going to get caught up on that because it's not the main focus of this passage. But within that, we do have to see that there are some who maybe have a tenuous connection to the church or to Jesus, who maybe even sit in the church for years and years and years and who have actually never had the sap of the Lord flow through them, who maybe just been sticking fruit on as they show up. And you can do it, but have never actually had that wonderful, intimate connection to the Lord, have never abided and for that reason never produced fruit, have never been pruned. And please, let me say, if you even think that that might be you, fall upon the wonderful grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. He's here saying, I am the vine, come, remain in me, trust me, and let me then flow through you in all that you do. Because what is this fruit? What is the fruit that we get to produce? Well, it's joy, isn't it? The joy that we get to experience and the very purpose of our absolute beings is able to be experienced because of Jesus, producing Christ-like fruits, Not so that we are judged, but it can be the test to see whether we are intimately engaged. His life flowing through you like the sap of the vine to the branches, the inward life. Just like me searching those cherry trees for that beautiful fruit. We can do the same thing in our inner lives, can't we? And we don't want just pea trees, do we? Have a listen back to Isaiah 5. I want to share with you Isaiah 5 again, because this is really telling. In Isaiah 5, what did it say at the end of verse 2? He dug it up, he took care of it, he loved his vine... Then he looked for a crop of good grapes, but it yielded only bad fruit. And what was the fruit down in verse 7? In verse 7 it said, He looked for justice, but saw bloodshed. He looked for righteousness, but heard cries of distress. He was desperate to see his very nature in his people. And that's the same thing here with Christ Jesus in John 15. Verse 5, I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. And then he goes on in verses 9 to sort of 15 to talk about love. And we talked about that a couple of weeks ago, so I'm not going to jump in on that too much. But a reminder that this love for one another, as he has loved them, will reveal to them this beautiful, beautiful reality that he is, that they are the, his disciples. And so in verse 16, we get the very purpose of all of this. He says, you did not choose me. Just like God did, that Israel did not choose Yahweh, the Lord, no, you did not choose me, 
But I chose you and appointed you so that you might go and bear fruit, fruit that will last. And so that whatever you ask in my name, the Father will give you. There it is. The very purpose of our existence, chosen to bear fruit. What fruit? Kiwi berries? You had a kiwi berry yet? I'd never had a kiwi berry until this week. So I opened the fridge, there were grapes, and next to the grapes were these things called kiwi berries. Has there, nobody in here has had a kiwi berry? Maybe? Yeah? What do you think, Isaac? They're great. They're a little berry about the size of... Yes, you too, Jasmine. A little grape about the size of a... Of a, uh, of a uh, little berry about the size of a grape. Slow down. And when you bite into it, that's what it looks like on the inside. A kiwi fruit. And it tastes like a kiwi fruit without the fur. It's incredible. It's delicious. It's strange. It's very, very strange. That is not the fruit that's being talked about here. It's not strange. It's not unusual. It's not something that's been sort of manufactured. It is the fruit of the vine. I am the vine, Jesus says. You are the branches. Jesus, life in us. Now, some of us might think, well, that must be evangelistic endeavours. That must be that ecstatic expression. And there's been churches that push and promote that. That is not what this is talking about. That those can be fruits. I am the vine, he says. You are the branches. It isn't strange. You go to a cherry tree, you expect cherries. You go to a Christian, you expect the fruit that Christ would bring, the true vine. What did he produce? Well, justice and righteousness, didn't he? What were his works? Restoration and renewal. He brought the kingdom to this place and it was extraordinary. But most deeply, we will begin to look more and more and more like Jesus. You'll be able to walk up to a person who calls himself a Christian, gaze through the outer leaves, pull back a branch and see right there, The inner life looks just like Jesus. So does that sap flow? Are you seeing the fruit of the Spirit, really? Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, self-control. Is that flowing in your life? All of it. It's the fruit, not the fruits. This present in our people, inside of us, the very fruit of the Spirit. You know those lives that are like that, don't you? If you don't, I could point some out to you in this congregation and I could tell you some stories about some people in my life. Those lives who abide, who persist, who are intimately connected, who have drawn near, who draw from, who depend on. Those are the lives who have been under the blade too, who have been pruned. They'll tell you. Those are the lives who produce fruit that will last and you'll see it. The world may not recognise it, but we will. Fruit presents a particular way too, doesn't it? And there's one thing I just want to focus on to finish. In verse 7, what's the fruit that presents? If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. What's the fruit? Prayer. 16, verse 16 has the exact same thing, prayer. And it makes sense, doesn't it? If we are a people here at Menno Baptist Church who are the fruit of the vine, who are bearing the fruit of the vine, we will be prayers dependent upon him, asking and asking and asking. Why? Because we want the powerful work of the Lord to happen. Verse 8, This is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. What a joy this is. What a joy that Jesus has told us this so that our joy, that his joy may be in us and that our joy may be complete. What a wonderful thing it is that we get to be people who abide in, who get pruned because he loves us and then produce this fruit to the glory of his name. We're going to sing a song now, and so the band might want to come up. We're going to sing a song right now that talks about this. Christ is mine. We're going to actually talk about the fact that we get to have him forever and we get to dwell with him. And and listen to the words as you sing this, and please sing it, have your masks on. But this song is also an opportunity for us to, um, if you've given your gifts during the, the week, if you've made your offerings during the week online, or if you're about to give down here, for you to reflect upon that and offer your offerings now to our great and glorious God as an act of worship. And so I might just pray, and then these guys will take us away to close our service. Lord and Heavenly Father, thank you so much for Jesus, that because of what he did on the cross, we then have an opportunity and a way to be made clean, to then abide in him, to have a a relationship where he dwells within us, that his life source flows in and through us, making us more and more like him. Lord, please prepare us for the pruning. Although we don't like it, we know it's for our good. And please help us to be a church that bears great fruit.
that we produce fruit that brings praise and glory to the Father's name so that people might see that we are disciples and they too may become disciples of you, abide with you and be able to love you. Lord, we come bringing our offerings now, either physically but also in our hearts, remembering how it is that we get to praise and worship you through all of our lives. And so we bring this to you through the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.